Thank you very much for this presentation. I think we're starting to get the picture that behind the Soviet bloc was not one unitary bloc, and there were so many differences in application and understanding and interpretation. Yugoslavia and Yugoslavia was not part of the Soviet Yeah, well, yeah, the certain point, the, right. So um, anyway, so I think now we're moving to Poland, which is, will give us another angle. Uh, uh, on this area. Uh, so, v so Jakub Pokoj uh, from Gielonian University, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, in Serbia, uh, will speak about from capitalism to Stalinism, transition of Polish law of obligations in the Stalinist period of 1948 till 1956. Uh, so a bit into the Khrushchev period, uh, and Jakub Pokoy is a fifth year student of master's degree studies in law, uh, vice president of Students Scientific Association of History of State and Law at the Department of Law and Administration of Jagiellonian University. Hello. Uh, to begin, I must admit that you were right at first. Uh, so, Jagiellonian University is situated in Krakow in Poland. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> definitely I am going to talk about the situation in Poland, which actually was uh, quite different uh, from the uh, abrogation of the whole private law in Yugoslavia. Uh, so at first I want to thank the organizers for invitation. It is uh, with great pleasure for me to give a speech to such an honorable audience. Uh, the title of my speech is uh, From Capitalism to Stalinism, Transition of Polish Law in the Stalinist Period, which in Poland uh, happened between 1948 and 1956. Uh, the Red Army's invasion of eastern part of Poland um, in July 1944 resulted in a new political situation. Uh, Soviet troops were followed by Clarks aimed to establish uh, a new Soviet, uh, pro-Soviet administration and build new social political order. Uh, during the first few months of the new government, Many crucial reforms were done, including, including for example, expropriation of landowners. Uh, Polish, Polish communists at first were not strong enough to openly carry out all the reforms aimed at making Polish legal system allied the Soviet one. But with passage of time, the situation changed. In June 1945, provisional government of national unity was formed of most of major political parties. Although the communists were a minority in the cabinet, they filled the key posts, including Ministry of Security and Ministry of Defense. Um, this enabled the communists to gradually, using the so-called salami tactics, increase influence on Polish politics. Consequently, about 1948, communists seized total power over the state and initiating establishment of Polish state on the model of U USSR. Polish historians therefore assume that the Stalinist period in Poland began about 1948. As regards to the closing date of Stalinism in Poland, first symptoms of the fall were noticeable in 1955, but uh, the definite uh, end of Stalinism came when Władysław Gomułka took over power in October 1956. Uh, hence, my speech relates to the period between 1948 and 1956. Establishment of a new kind of Polish state, the 
People's Republic of Poland required various social, po political and economical reforms. The process of assimilating legal system into its Marxist model was particularly distinct in the field of law of obligations. Uh, Karl Marx stated that, quote, private law develops simultaneously to private property, unquote. Consequently, law of obligations was one of the branches of law which had to be transferred within the maximum extent. Nevertheless, Polish communists have never decided to abrogate the whole private law. The question is, why didn't they? I, I suppose that it would be easier to do this like it was in Yugoslavia, to abrogate the whole private law and begin to build the new order, the, uh, the new Stalinist, let's say, totalitarian order. Historians usually indicate weak social support of the communist regime as the cause of sustaining Polish antebellum legal system in force. Communists were attempting to maintain in Polish society the belief that uh, the new authorities are not imposed by Soviet troops, that they are consistent with constitutional principles of the Second Polish Republic. Most of institutions of Polish law of obligations were regulated in the Code of Obligations. The Code was based on such legal principles as freedom of contract, nominalism, or equality. The creators, the main creators of the Code, Professors uh, Roman Longchamp de Berrier and Ernest Thieu, aimed to draft such a bill that would conform the conditions of free market economy in the broadest possible manner. In particular areas, the Code of Obligations imitated such regulations as Code of Napoleon, Agemeines Birgerliches Gesetzbuch, Birgerliches Gesetzbuch, and Civil Gesetzbuch. The bill was passed in 1933, and it was then considered as one of the most modern codes in the field of law of obligations. After this lengthy introduction, finally I may begin to present the changes done in Polish uh, law of obligations in the Stalinist period. People's Republic of Poland, which claimed to be successor of the interwar Polish state, maintained persistence of Polish legal system, including law of obligations. However, for the new Polish government, it was vital to erase any remains of the past era of capitalism that would not conform the conditions of Marxism-Leninism. Hence, Polish communists were putting grand, great emphasis on the process of re redefining principles of private law. As I've already mentioned, in the period following the end of World War II, Polish communists were not strong enough to openly enforce all of their demands. It was also evident in the field of law of obligations, where the first serious amendment was passed in the end of 1946. The bill entitled the General Rules of Civil Law was passed on the 12th of November 1946. It consisted of several general clauses, one of which stated custom as a source of law. All the general clauses were directly applicable to code of obligations. A custom could come into force if it was in use all over the territory of Poland. Please note that at the time there were in Poland still in force remains of at least three different systems of private law. So the German, the Austrian code, uh, and the Napoleonic code. This made the condition of being used throughout Poland practically impossible to accomplish. The, in case that neither statutory regulation nor custom could be used, the basis, uh, defining the basis for the sentence was left to judge, to, it, to its judiciary discretion. There was also the social purposes clause 
included in the Bill of 1946, the clause determined that any civil right can be exercised only for its social purpose and it should retain bona fide. It should be added that originally in the Code of Obligations there was the Good Morality Clause. Infringement of good morals could result in declaring a particular contract null and void at ex officio. This clearly shows that the Code of Obligations con contained legal instruments for the possibility of making private law more socially fair. So what was the purpose of adding several new general clauses to Polish private law? I will try to answer this question in the end of my speech. Nevertheless, the communists did not achieve their goal at once. In 1945, 46, or even in 1947, there were not many judges educated al along the lines of Stalinism. So the general clauses were not used in the way it was intended for. It should be added that at this period, let's say, politically correct judges were usually members of criminal courts in order to re take repressive measures. Special High School for Judges was founded in 1946, where courses lasting from six to 15 months were conducted for future judges, just like in Lithuania. Uh, so, so the courts were filled with uh, Stalinist judges not earlier than in 1948. So. Uh, this made the, the year so crucial in the process of making Polish private law al like the Soviet one. As I have already mentioned, the Stalinist period in history of Poland began in 1948. Until then, there were not many changes in Polish private law done, as well in the Code of Obligation. In particular, the amendments were aimed to impose social responsibility of part on parties of contracts. For example, the regulation of lease was reformed in favor of tenant. Also, the regulation on the right to a life annuity was redefined. Beginning from 1948, activity of Polish Supreme Court civil chamber was increased. Worth noting is very passed by Polish Supreme Court on the 21st of June 1948. Referring to regulation of contract of lease, judges pointed out that exercising one's rights shall not be contrary to Article 5, Paragraph 1 of the General Rules of Civil. This was the Social Purposes Clause. In case that one exercised the right against Article 5, Paragraph 1, the contract is null and Void. Though there was no sanction of nullity in the regulation, according to the jurisprudence of the Polish Supreme Court, particular contract could be declared null and void. In, in the end of the 40s, compliance of the aforementioned general clauses with principles of Marxism-Leninism was questioned. Consequently, new bill on general rules of civil law was passed on the 18th of July, 1915. The good morality clause was abolished by introductory regulations. Article 1 of general rules of civil law of 1950 stated that regulations of law shall be interpreted and applied in compliance with principles of political system and aims of the people's state. So, of course, uh, defining the principles of political system and aims of the people's state was left to judges who were educated in the, let's say, six-month courses in Stalinist school. Uh, the second general clause was included in Article 3, which stated that one may not use his right in a manner which would be contrary to principles of community coexistence in people's state. Uh, the rules of community coexistence are uh, 
an idea that still exists in Polish private and Polish civil law. Um, but uh, I suppose that uh, not in this manner I mention right now. Uh, when intensification of efforts on making Polish uh, private law allied to the Soviet one came, Polish Supreme Court issued some interpretation of the general clauses. After the general rules of civil law of 1950 was passed, civil courts were already filled with judges who were educated along the lines of Stalinism. This had a great impact of, on the process of making judicial decisions. The principles of interpretation of a legal text were expressed in verdict passed by the Polish Supreme Court on the 5th of June 1951. Quote, the principles of revolutionary law and order require application of laws remaining in force, but not in case when reforms of the political system and principles of community coexistence caused by revolutionary transition from bourgeois state to people's state require declaring particular regulations as not corresponding to changed social relations. In this very case, Polish Supreme Court adjudicating on the basis of Article 1 and Article 3 of the General Rules of Civil Law of 1950 declared that some regulations are simply not in force because they are not suitable for a totalitarian Stalinist state. The, the facts of the case were as follows. A factory worker was seriously injured in an accident. He sued his employer, which actually was a state legal person. Uh, the court dismissed the claim and stated that compensation for harm cannot be granted from the state, whereas strict liability was uh, included in code of obligations and, and there was no limitation for state legal persons. As you can see, efforts aimed to give new meaning to various regulations in the field of obligations can be described as at least triple or maybe three-fold. By amendments, for interpretations of general clauses and by judicial decisions. Adapting Polish private law to the idea of people's state did not require abrogation of the whole private law. In this area, communists were making slow but steady progress in order to achieve their goals. First, some amendments were done, particularly in these areas where it was socially accepted. Later on, some new general clauses were added. Finally, judges were given possibility to change meaning of particular regulations without changing the letter of law. Therefore, I suppose to name the process as triple Stalinization of private law. Thank you very much for your attention.